Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics today for our online live event with Patrick Honahan and Ashoka Modi on the occasion of Patrick's new book, Europe and the Transformation of the Irish Economy, co-authored with John Fitzgerald. It is great to have two very first-rate economists who also served in critical policy roles during the Irish, European, and global financial crises um, to discuss this, both the significance of Ireland and for Ireland, but also the broader lessons and implications for the world economy. Uh, Patrick Honahan, I'm proud to say, has been with us uh, more than seven years as a non-resident senior fellow. Uh, he's very non-resident. It's rare we get him led live in person, but he's a very active contributor, both in written form and in our internal discussions. Patrick previously was, of course, the governor of the Central Bank of Ireland and was a member of the governing council of the European Central Bank during the critical years from September 2009 to November 2015. Um, prior to that, he had been at Trinity College Dublin, which we all know is a great seat of economic knowledge, where he was Professor of International Financial Economics and has since been named Finance and Development, excuse me, and since has been named an honorary professor. Um, Patrick also spent 12 years on the staff of the World Bank as a senior advisor on financial sector issues before he went to Trinity College. He's the co-author in addition to today's book, and again, I repeat the title, Europe and the Transformation of the Irish Economy, numerous other studies, including Finance for All, Financial Liberalization, How Far, How Fast, and Finance for Growth. Um, Ashoka Modi, who's joining us remotely today as our discussant, is the Charles and Marie Robertson Visiting Professor in International Economic Policy at the School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton. Uh, long title, but just to say, Ashok is one of the more outspoken with substance people in the international finance sphere, uh, and I say that as head of a Washington think tank. Um, he previously, before going to Princeton, he was deputy director uh, in the International Monetary Funds Research and European Departments. And in particular, uh, relevant for today, he was also responsible for the design of Ireland's financial rescue program during the crisis. Um, he's previously had worked at the World Bank, including in project finance and guarantees and in economic prospects. Um, he's been an advisor to various governments and is the author of two publications I want to mention in addition to his academic, Euro Tragedy, A Drama in Nine Acts, which was one of the key books to go looking back on the financial crisis in Europe. And more recently, India is Broken, uh, People Betrayed Independence to Today. Uh, but today we're going to focus on Ireland and the lessons from that. Uh, and Patrick, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Adam. Adam, I don't know whether you saw in this week's Economist newspaper that uh, they announced that Ireland is the winner of their European Economic Performance Pentathlon. 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 Well, I'm not sure about that, but even if we acknowledge the numerous deficiencies and shortcomings and setbacks, it's undoubtedly clear that the last several decades have seen economic prosperity in Ireland uh, make advances that seemed impossible half a century ago. And this has also been the period of Ireland's membership of the European Union. It followed a long period of stagnation in the shadow of its large neighbor and former ruler, the United Kingdom. So what is the connection? Exactly what is the turning point? What has been the turning point in Ireland's economic fortunes? It's, it's less clear. And, and that's the question that we discuss in this and um, distill in this new book. Uh, let me give you a flavor of some of what we've we've found. Um, so when, when was the turning point? The turning points, there were different turning points. Population started to grow from 1961, productivity from the early 1970s, per capita consumption in the late 1980s, employment growth really in the 1990s. Um, so as you can see there for, from the slide, and by the way, I am not going to show any figures today are more or less ever using GDP for Ireland. It's highly misleading for reasons that we'll touch on, on, on later. So how did the deepening relationship with Europe influence the extent, uh, the nature, and the timing of this economic transformation? 
I suppose one naturally thinks of the four freedoms of uh, the European Union, the freedoms of goods and services, people, capital, and they are all ingredients in this story of transformation. But arguably more important than the four freedoms within Europe has been the way in which joining the EU catalyzed a much larger opening up of the Irish economy to the opportunities of what was then an increasingly globalizing, globalized world. The Irish policymakers who advocated membership more than 60 years ago when it all started, they saw progress to free trade with Europe as crucial in expanding the market for Irish agriculture and industry. Now, agriculture clearly benefited from the high prices that, that um, they were secured in the outset. And there was an expectation that value added on top, the value added processing of agricultural products would drive industrial expansion. So removing the barriers to trade would force Irish firms to improve efficiency, to compete with British and continental firms. But actually, many of the old firms did not prosper. They didn't survive. Instead, it was inward foreign direct investment by firms that would supply both European and other foreign markets. They were encouraged by grants, and they were encouraged especially by the low rates of corporation profits tax. 10% and later 12.5%. And that proved to be the distinctive characteristic or flavor of Ireland's industrial modernization. Just look at the, the numbers there in the next slide and notice these are, you can study them later, but these are figures of foreign direct investment in the world and sorry, into the European Union and into Ireland from all parts of the world. The Irish figures move up and down more or less with the European ones, but they are all two to three times higher than the European ones because they're on different scales on both sides of the slide. The next thing that happened was the European single market. It was a second wave of goods and services integration. Uh, for example, it eliminated national preferences in public procurement. And that was unleashed at the start of 1993. It greatly deepened the process of European trade integration and increased the attraction of Ireland as an export platform for foreign-owned firms. Now, Ireland was already an especially favoured destination of US foreign direct investment. And Ireland experienced a disproportionate inflow in the 1990s from the US as the European single market came into, into effect. But free access to the European market turned out to be only part of the benefit of this globalization of production, as new firms increasingly supplied a world market and not just Europe. As you can see in the next slide, uh, there you can see that the export destinations, yes, in the early years of the European Union, it's uh, of Ireland's membership of, of, of Europe, uh, the share of European trade grew and grew, and then it sort of stopped. And the subsequent growth was growth to, in exports to the US and to the rest of the world. So it was not just a case of tariff jumping. The other thing that FDI brought was new, new sectors, new fields of production, information services, information technology, medical instruments, pharmaceuticals. And so Ireland's industrial structure, it actually became quite a big outlier, especially in regard to the share of non-EU foreign owned firms. Let's look at the numbers there in the next slide. Uh, well, it's a slide that is very small in my, where I'm looking at it, but you can see towards the top, Ireland has jumped out of all the other European countries. And what, what this slide is showing is that the, the blue bits are the part of business sector owned by foreign companies coming from the rest of the European Union. And the other colors show rest of the world. So you can see that Ireland relies on foreign direct investment from the rest of the world, not Europe, much more than any of the other European uh, countries. I can't overstate, though, the importance of one trap for analysts of Irish economic data. Conventional accounting practice generates statistics on output, trade, and productivity that really overstate the true performance 
in Ireland of the world's major technological and pharmaceutical companies. Nevertheless, over the last 50 years, FDI has made a major contribution to rising living standards, growing up employment, tax revenue, know-how. The multinational corporations didn't create the Celtic Tiger of the 1990s, but their growth was a significant part of it. They did not provide much insulation of the economy from the global financial crisis, but they greatly helped strengthen the public finances during the more recent pandemic years, 2020 to 2022. Perhaps look at another slide there showing the growth in corporation profits tax receipts. I'm sure that slide will come up now in a minute. Next slide, please. Thank you. There it is, the, the, the yellow curve at the bottom showing the rapid growth in corporation tax revenue as, as a share of total tax revenue. That's been a big, a big factor. It took a long time for Irish controlled businesses to really benefit from the linkages and spillovers that had been hoped for by industrial organization economists. Uh, eventually, though, new or growing Irish owned firms in such fields as agribusiness, building materials, air transport, uh, also became firmly established internationally. Ryanair is the largest airline in Europe. CRH claims to be the largest construction materials firm in both the US and the EU. And e these Irish uh, controlled firms also took full advantage of the globalized world economy and not just Europe. <clears throat> now, translating this transformation of productive forces into broader based and sustained prosperity called for steps that lay largely in the hands of the national government and not with the EU. Arguably, the two most important of these were education and macroeconomic stability. Now, already in the 1960s, the government recognized that Ireland had fallen well behind in ensuring access to education at second and third levels. Measures were taken to correct this. And you can see from the next slide <clears throat> that Ireland really not only caught up but moved ahead of uh, other European countries. The, the bottom three uh, bars there show the old, the, uh, the old Irish people and what their educational attainment is more or less at the moment, but in a recent year, uh, much less than in the UK and the rest of the EU. But the younger generation have moved ahead of the young generation in these other, uh, in these other countries in more recent years. There was less success in the matter of macroeconomic stability. Fiscal policy mistakes following the oil price rises of the 1970s led to a loss of competitors and a debt overhang, which resulted in a deep macroeconomic crisis for most of the 1980s. And this delayed convergence of the economy to its full employment potential. So it was only by the end of the 1980s that both of these key ingredients, education and macroeconomic stability were in place. The benign environment created by the single European market, falling transportation and communications costs provided the additional push to generate that Celtic Tiger period of export-led employment growth. Competitive and productive, the business sector at last ended the involuntary joblessness that had been endemic. So Ireland then experienced two decades of rapid economic catch-up towards full employment and towards the living standards of the leading group of EU countries. Uh, there's a slide there which you can look at in the book show, showing the uh, rapid catch up in per capita income and per capita consumption, uh, making all the necessary adjustments to correct for the distortions brought into Irish statistics by the multinational corporations. Indeed, migration flows went into reverse. You can look at that in the next slide. Migration in the years before European, ne next slide, um, yeah, so you can see emigration in the early decades of the 20th century and gradually a reversal towards net immigration in more recent years. And much of the sizable immigration of the last few decades has been from the new wave of EU member states after 2004, reflecting the European Union freedom of personal movement. You can look at that in the next slide. Population growth since 1961 was also boosted by returning migrants. In contrast, only a small proportion of Irish emigrants chose destinations in continental Europe. So the freedom of um, personal movement has not been a really, uh, it, it's been a, a mixed bag. Armed with more years of education, the workforce was more productive. The share of po the population 
at work outside of agriculture grew rapidly in the years of EU membership, with far more women participating than before, especially those who benefited from the expansion of second and third level of education. You can see a, a graph that shows the, uh, here in the next figure, shows the growth in the population and of course the proportionate, disproportionate growth in the numbers at work, that red line at the bottom. European social policy played a role here, for example, on equal pay for women, and it likely influenced Irish policies that helped limit the deterioration in income inequality. And I have a chart there showing the Gini coefficient. Next slide. Uh, the Gini coefficient, you can see the green Irish numbers falling generally from the mid-1990s up to the latest data and falling below the Gini coefficient in, in the e rest of the EU and in the UK. But as the new millennium began, government again allowed macroeconomic imbalances associated with reckless and under-supervised banking to re-emerge in the later years of the catch-up, leaving Ireland disastrously exposed to the global financial crisis. So freedom of mobile capital in the European Union thus proved to be a mixed blessing. And these episodes of macroeconomic imbalance interacted with speculative capital flows from global financial markets to deepen the two severe macroeconomic crises, the one in the 1980s that I spoke about and the one in the global financial crisis. And neither of the two European currency arrangements in place during the two macroeconomic crises provided much protection. There are other aspects. Um, funding, regulations from Europe, the structural funds. Let's jump ahead two slides. The structural funds made a considerable contribution to Irish economic progress in the 1990s. Their expansion arrived at an ideal moment, encouraging the relaunching of many needed infrastructural and other government spending programs that had been deferred as the fiscal accounts were being repaired. The funds were well spent and the governance of the spending helped improve Irish administrative processes. Over a period during which public regulation of economic activity had to become more elaborate and prescriptive, Ireland's participation in the EU has helped ensure that its microeconomic policies reflect up-to-date international practice and are less prone to capture by sectional interests than might have been the case. Irish engagement in the design of these policies has varied, having been very active in the respect of agriculture, for example, but notably weaker in environmental protection over the years. And restrictive practices in domestic service sectors, such as the law, persist. Large areas of policy, such as these, remain a national responsibility, and solutions to the many obvious deficiencies in fields such as healthcare, legal services, and especially housing, can only be sought at home. I think we can end the slides now, just the last few words. There is a path dependency in the story of Ireland's economic transformation which precludes any simple decomposition into distinct contributions from each maiden causal factor, EU membership, stabilization policy, openness to the FDI and the low tax approach to attracting it, investment in education, globalization, and the European single market. For more than a decade after joining the EEC, the Irish economy was still in the doldrums owing to macroeconomic mismanagement. But during that time, the investment in human capital and the arrival of early waves of US multinational corporations were laying foundations of subsequent advances. Both of these ingredients were selected by policymakers whose awareness of international opportunities reflected an outward looking attitude informed by personal links to the diaspora and growing professional and personal links to continental Europe. Thanks to these foundations, the economy was uniquely well placed to benefit from globalization and from the European single market, which arrived soon after macroeconomic balance had been restored. That gives you a flavor of the material we've covered and the analysis that we have provided of Ireland's experience over the last 50 years, the 50 years of European Union membership. Thank you, Patrick. Could you hand me your hard copy of the book so I can hold it up on the screen? Yeah, thank you for the masterful summary of Europe and the Transformation of the Irish Economy by John Fitzgerald and Patrick Conahan. And now maybe a somewhat alternative view from our distinguished commentator, Ashoka Modi. 
not necessarily alternative, uh, I hope a complementary view. Uh, let me first say what a great pleasure it is, uh, known Patrick for a long time, at the height of the bailout one day, he and I were walking from the finance ministry to the central bank. And I looked up suddenly and said, Patrick, do you walk uh, from the, the finance ministry? And he looked at me seriously, he normally flips such comments with a joke. He looked at me seriously and said, I want the people to see their governor is like them. That's a beautiful statement. And, you know, Patrick is a man of great humanity, a great scholarship, and uh, now a great book. Uh, I am going to make two propositions. One is that the connection that he and uh, John Fitzgerald draw with Europe is overdrawn. Uh, Ireland is a great story, and I, the Irish story needs needed to be told. And this is, I think, in my, my understanding, the first comprehensive modern economic history of Ireland, for which reason, I will use it as a reference point for me, my students, and I hope uh, scholars around the world and policymakers will also use it. It's a great story. Uh, just as a reference point in January 1988, The Economist had a cover with the title Poor Iron. And the cover had a beggar woman on a Dublin street uh, with a child in her lap and a begging bowl in front of her. It was such a condescending piece, so demeaning, that in, in retrospect, I wondered how it even got to be written, but it condemned Ireland as a country that was both profligate and uh, unredeemable. And the great thing about The Economist is that it makes the best predictions because you know that the opposite of what it predicts will happen. So it's very reliable. And indeed, at that very moment, the Celtic tiger was beginning to growl and uh, the, the corporation tax that uh, Patrick referred to was very much in place. The reason I want to ignore the European part is that there is a very strong Irish component to the Irish success. It is a story of domestic policy. It's a story of leadership. And to, to draw that out, I think, is the main task of this book. Now, the, the timing of much of what happened, the dominance of investment from the United States and the rest of the world, tell me that it was a much more global phenomenon. So the, the story as now putting on my development economics hat, uh, the story that, that Patrick tells, which I think is a beautiful story, is that this was a country that plugged into the global networks of trade and, and, and investment. And it complemented that with a vast um, uh, investment in human capital. Plus, in his remarks today, he also makes reference to bringing more women into the labor force. If you look at Odin Galore's recent book, uh, I think it's called The Journey of Humanity, he makes, he makes the observation that every country since the Industrial Revolution, every successful country has done two things. It's, it's provided mass education and it's brought more women into the workforce. And by that, by that standard, Ireland fits exactly into the framework of globally successful nations. From that moment when the economist had this very derisory uh, essay on uh, Ireland as poor Ireland, today Ireland is perhaps the richest country in Europe. 
Uh, and that success is very much built on the policies, the twin policies of uh, attracting foreign investment and creating strong human capital. These are Irish achievements. What Patrick also mentioned today in his presentation, which I think is worth emphasizing, is that this is also a period in which inequalities actually decline. Now, and these inequality numbers are always a bit, uh, one has to be cautious in interpreting them. But broadly, what it is saying is that if you educate a population and give them employment opportunities, then you curtail some of the worst excesses of a capitalist system that only rewards the rich and powerful. And you see this pattern also in East Asia, Korea, Taiwan, uh, especially up until their uh, recent uh, increases in inequality showed a very dynamic uh, process, very similar in broad outline to what Patrick says. Human capital, more women in the labor force, less inequality, and rapid growth. So Ireland fits beautifully into that overall development economics pattern. As I said, this is the first book to tell that story. And therefore, just by that virtue of that story it tells, it's a very important book. There are two things that I would like to emphasize, which are not touched on enough. And I, which I think again, from a development point of view are very important. One is that the Irish institutions have shown a remarkable resilience. So in the eighties where the growth was beginning to take off was also a period of vast corruption in Ireland. Uh, this was a period not just of corruption, but of larger than life uh, prime ministers who were always uh, operating on the, on the fringes of the law. This was when the agricultural land was being converted into urban land. And like everywhere else, it was, it was a racket. What is important now putting on my India hat is that Ireland overcame that period of institutional, near institutional breakdown. And it's that overcoming that is crucial in my view as a, as a marker of a very distinct and committed uh, citizenry as well as leadership. Uh, there was a few handful of very uh, upright judges who finally set this uh, uh, set Ireland back on course away from that, that corrupt regime. A second institutional uh, uh, example of inst uh, Irish institutional resilience happens during the crisis. Uh, again, this uh, he, uh, uh, Patrick refers to this only briefly in the book. There was a large regulatory failure that led to the banking uh, problems. Again, larger than life figures, uh, the Anglo-Irish, and such like were, uh, were busy uh, uh, doing things that they should not have been doing, building on a narrative of success. Uh, Oliver Wyman described uh, Anglo-Irish as the world's most successful bank, just about when it was, it was collapsing. Uh, and having failed, and the failure was broad-based, there is a 2006, uh, IMF financial stability report that gives the green light uh, and, and glowing remarks to the Irish banking regulatory system just when it was completely broken. One of uh, Patrick's personal successes as governor is that he put back the regulatory system uh, on, uh, on Ireland's uh, banking system. Uh, how robust that will eventually prove to be, only time will tell. But again, extremely important achievement of institutional resilience built by 
uh, committed uh, public uh, servants, as well as supported by the broader public. There's one point, uh, finally, I will say, and then I will close. Uh, the, the one place where the Europeans were coming in the way rather than helping was in their demands for austerity during the course of the crisis. And it is the only reason I remark on this is that it is commonplace for Europeans to say, look, the Irish did the austerity we asked them to do. And why can't everybody be good like Ireland was? And they particularly complain about Greece and Portugal and so on that squealed heavily. There are two problems with that, 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 that view. One is that in Ireland, for reasons that historians will have to judge, uh, Jay Chopra and I were a buffer between the Europeans and the Irish in modulating the demands for austerity. And I think our role is, is, has been well documented, um, including uh, in uh, reports by Kevin Cardiff and so on. Brian Lenihan uh, and I had a very strong uh, personal friendship. And I remember the conversations in Brian's office. And the second is that Ireland was able to quickly escape that period of austerity because of its low corporate tax. And so the multinationals that had briefly steered away from Ireland during the period of crisis came rushing back and the, the history of the crisis was quickly erased. So Ireland is not an example of good austerity. Ireland is an example that, of a country that escaped the ill effects of excessive European austerity by good fortune. I'll conclude by saying uh, I was struck by Patrick's comment that the economist has declared Ireland a champion, an economic champion of sorts. That kind of thing worries me because the economist track record is unfortunately uh, a very is a very unfortunate one, and I hope that we are not at a moment. Again, this time in reverse, when Ireland, so utterly dependent on the corporate tax, the low corporate tax to the point where uh, people like Gabriel Zuckman say it's perhaps the world's largest tax haven, that if this, if this foundation of Irish growth disappears because of the demand for common corporate tax rates, minimum corporate tax rates, does Ireland have an alternative model on which it will develop in, in the years to come? So with that, let me thank uh, uh, Patrick again for a, an important book. As I said, I will be recommending it uh, to, to various people, and I hope it will find a very broad readership. Thank you so thank much, you. Ashok. Um, let me pose a question to both of you, which I think is the sort of obvious question out of some things Patrick said sort of gently and implicitly, and you concluded with, Ashok, which is how much can Ireland be a model for anybody else? I'm not saying either of you say it should be. I'm, this is a genuine question. How much can it be a model for anyone else? Because as an English-speaking rule of law, inside the European Union, uh, very small, it had a very privileged place to play the tax game for multinational profits. And sort of going forward, broadening out Ashok's last point, if either we have a US fi Senate finally passing what's needed to get a global corporate minimum tax, or we have a breakdown further of globalization, you know, and is the Irish path closed to others in future, even if they could have done it? Um, maybe, Patrick, if you want to respond to anything from Ashok as well as my question, 
Mm. We can start with you. I mean, I, I've been sounding like a broken record for 40 years on the the footlooseness of, of uh, international capital, in particular when it's being driven by tax, not just by tax, but, but to a, a significant yeah. extent by, by uh, um, tax. And um, now it has become a huge source of government tax revenue as well as... Uh, look, the risks are broader than just the FDI, the tax-driven FDI. The risks are of a globalization shrinking and constraining. The tax dimension, I think, will come to an end, um, and that is well understood in Ireland. And fortunately, there has been an emergence of Irish controlled enterprises as well. The foreign companies that are present in Ireland are not going to go because the tax laws have changed. They have advantages anyway. The, the tax laws are the icing mm -hmm. on the cake. Uh, but it, it is a concern. But as I say, broken record, how many more decades before this, this uh, actually falls away? It's a balance of political uh, considerations in the US and in other countries that have kept this system going. And also, as you suggest, the 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 one foot in Boston and the one foot in Berlin of the Irish business sector, which has allowed Ireland to benefit from this European and American globalization. As someone who grew up in Boston in the 60s and 70s and saw the mass migration of people out from Ireland, uh, I feel this very strongly. Asha. Yeah, very briefly, uh, uh, when I think of, of Ireland as a model, uh, I do not necessarily think, Adam, purely in terms of the low corporate tax. Uh, I, I think that countries will use alternative mechanisms to attract foreign investment. I think what is important about uh, Ireland is the marriage of foreign investment with domestic human capital and bringing women into the workforce. That is a broad model of success can be applied even in today's context without necessarily the, the sort of ultra low corporation tax that, that Ireland had. And to that extent, the Irish model survives. I think looking forward is the issue where, I, where Ireland has to build on its domestic human capital to move into higher uh, technology areas such that its reliance on foreign capital disappears. I agree with Patrick that there is a, there is a considerable inertia in, in foreign capital. So David Wheeler and I did a paper 25, 30 years ago where we said foreign investors go where foreign investors go. There is this inertia or path dependence that uh, Patrick talked about. I think that will continue to bring investment, but the question is what is the nature of that investment that comes and how the domestic human capital will respond to the higher demands of the technologies that will then be deployed in Ireland for its future success. Thank you for that. Um, just to note, our registered guests, participants on Zoom, can submit questions over the Q&A function. We have three. One of them from Roman Palmer was about to what extent can Ireland rely on the pharma high tech sectors into the future? And I think the replies by Patrick and, and Ashoka have already sort of addressed that. Another question over Q&A from Peter Bradley, and you can continue to submit, is what impact do you see from potential Irish unification or reunification? Yes, well, somebody asked me what percentage of nationalists and unionists were existed now in the north of Ireland. And it's important to realize that whatever that percentage is, Nothing is going to be decided on the basis of a 50% plus one calculation of uh, broad preferences for being in a country that's in the European Union as opposed to a country that's in the United Kingdom. And um, so this is a, a long term perspective. Uh, of course, everything that has happened as a result of Brexit has uh, made people think very hard in Northern Ireland about uh, economic conditions and where where their advantages lie. But I think there hasn't been enough uh, deep thinking about what a different constitutional arrangement on the island of Ireland would look like. There has from time to time, but people say, oh, well, unification or not unification, that's 
that's only the first question. The next question is, what would unification look, look like? You know, there are different traditions, different, it's not really ethnicities, but there are different traditions, and that must be acknowledged in any new constitutional arrangement that existed on the island. And that's something that people only start to talk about, partly because to talk about it suggests that you are urging a change in the constitutional arrangements. And, and some people say, well, I don't even want to open that, that uh, door, uh, even if the answer to the question is not a good idea. But yet we have to consider it, it's not just a question of saying, wipe away uh, the, the invisible border and everything will still be decided by Dublin with the doll and the parliamentary arrangements that we have. That won't do. Thank you. Um, Ashok, let me give you the third of our online questions. And again, we have time for probably one more if someone submits a good one. Um, uh, Callie Jordan asks, what was the significance of the internationalization of finance? in the transformation of the Irish economy? I mean, obviously both good and ill. How do you see that? Well, yeah, so again, Patrick is obviously uh, very well informed on this. Uh, I, my, my own view on this is that it, on, on balance, it was uh, a net negative. Uh, and again, uh, as the book uh, uh, very ably points out, that the funding of uh, Anglo-Irish, Allied Irish, uh, much of it came from international sources. In fact, this was another part of the European integration, which uh, where the fixed exchange rate proves to be a liability because uh, the monies coming in from Germany and uh, to a smaller extent from France, they, they are coming in on the presumption that there is no exchange rate risk and the interest rates are declining. So they are lending large amounts of money uh, at virtually free uh, at, at, or near zero interest rates. Uh, spreads are, are zero. Ireland is booming. Ireland seems a completely uh, risk-free country. I think that contributed greatly to the extraordinary Irish boom and the exuberance, which was completely irrational in, in Bob Schiller's terminology. So to that extent, I think that the financial integration was, was a bane rather than a, a, a boon. Uh, also, the, 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 the Irish, um, the building of the banks took up a lot of prime property and so on. Anyhow, sorry. Uh, but no, no, thank you, Ashok. I'm aware that we have a hard stop in about two minutes, possibly three. So I just want to try to get in two more questions, which I'll post to both of you, and then you can decide which part you want to answer. Charles Sheehan, in addition to complimenting your guys' great presentation, um, asks, you know, would you agree that Ireland could have managed its banking crisis without IMF EU bailout if uh, the ECB had begun acting as a lender of last resort earlier? Um, yeah, the um, the ECB could probably have uh, bought all the, the problematic securities all around the periphery of Europe and decided to solve the problem in that way. That is one solution. Some people say that it should have happened. It would have generated considerable moral hazard. Would that have been a price worth paying? It's a hard question. Um, the ECB were certainly worried and uh, didn't, didn't uh, they played, played hardball from time to time. But in the end, I think, um, I think we, we managed to survive despite um, maybe uh, not as much generosity as we hoped from not just the ECB, but from uh, European partners in general. I think people underestimate the degree to which policymakers were frightened. They weren't just you know, hostile to the countries in, in, in trouble. They were frightened that it would spill over to the system as a whole. Okay. I'm so afraid- The only thing I would add uh, to that, uh, Adam, is that it was a moment in which Ireland needed help, external help. And again, you know, this goes back to a, a received practice in international lending, that the help is best delivered where the person, where the country being helped is ready to receive it. And what was remarkable about Ireland was it was so well prepared in terms of its officials, in terms of its thinking, 
but I do not think that at that moment it could have done without that help. I will endorse. Uh, I think what I heard Patrick saying. If I'm if I'm not if I'm overstating the point, I think the ECB almost played a destructive role uh, during this process in terms of the austerity it was demanding and in terms of the conditions it was trying to lay. Uh, I think Ireland was fortunate to not uh, to not be subject to that. Thank you both, and thanks to the patients and the contributions of our audience. We were here today to discuss the new book, Europe and the Transformation of the Irish Economy by John Fitzgerald and Patrick Honahan. We were fortunate to have our Peterson Institute colleague, uh, Patrick Honahan, present, and our friend and colleague, Ashok Modi from Princeton, uh, also discuss. See you again soon. Thank you very much. Okay. okay, great. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Patrick. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ashok. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, yeah, that was great. I, I trust I did not say anything.